You are now listening to Nailed It, the orthopedic surgery podcast. Dr. Bishop, welcome to the Nailed It Ortho podcast. So happy to have you on. Thanks, Wendell. Thanks for having me. And we always start off just getting to know our guests with the, a couple of questions, uh, just getting to know you a little bit before we hop into the topic of the day. So I guess the number one age old topic is what made you kind of choose, you know, your specialty, you know, sports, uh, you know, for your uh, specialty, what made you go into that field? So, um, you know, I have a pretty s- simple answer that I was an athlete growing up. So that's how I at least got interested in treating athletes um, and sports myself. I was a runner. I ran division one cross country and track in college. Um, so sustained a fair number of injuries myself, which kind of got me inter- interested in orthopedics in general. Um, but I also um, just really enjoyed working with athletes, treating athletes. Um, and, you know, the fact that you, you can really make a difference and get people better, uh, keep them healthy, keep them doing the things they love. Um, I had a great mentor as well in sports medicine um, that I worked with uh, early on in medical school, but uh, Robin West, who took care at that time, she's taking care of the Steelers. She was taking care of um, uh, Pitt and a, a bunch of the teams over in Pittsburgh. Now she's in, in DC, but she was a big influence in me uh, kind of going into the sports field as well. Um, and that, you know, I got that experience early on in medical school. So it kind of helped uh, sway my decision and kind of solidify my decision to go into sports. Oh yeah, that's awesome. Um, and I guess this next question may be a little bit more of a selfish question since I'm going into sports, but any advice that you would give yourself, you know, about to start your fellowship year, um, you know, if you kind of going back and having gone through it and being in practice for X amount of years, we have a lot of, you know, residents and uh, chief residents, or I guess now people that are starting their fellowship year or just finishing off, but any uh, advice that you would give yourself if you had to looking back at it? I think number one, um, obviously try to do as many cases as, as you can. Um, you know, if there's an interesting case, uh, even if it's not your rotation, you have time to be on it, really try to go uh, and see those cases. The other thing I would say is take really good notes um, throughout your fellowship year. Like I used Evernote, which is, you know, just oh, yeah, me too. app. Yeah, it's great for taking notes. So like I would take pictures of the setup of cases. Um, you know, I, w- I would take pictures if I wasn't scrubbed in uh, of certain parts of the procedure. Um, and then you can kind of just put them in, in your Evernotes and literally just write down all the steps from, you know, prepping and draping to exposure to all the instrumentation people use. You know, one thing when you get early into practice that you don't always think about is like, oh, I, you know, what was that implant that we used? What company was that? Um, so, you know, which size um, uh, cannula do we use for that? And, and a rotator cuff uh, repair, like was it eight by three passport? Was it eight by four? Like what's the, what are the things you use? So there's all, all these small little details that, if you take notes uh, and and learn that in in your fellowship, that you don't have to be kind of having those questions early on in in practice because it's stressful enough um, if you can kind of take care of those things in advance. Yeah, I think that's, that is solid advice in me starting because I'm about to start my chief year, uh, I guess at the end of this week. And I'm like, oh man, time's like almost up. So I'm going back and like looking at my notes and trying to fill everything in. So I think that's just, you know, solid advice. And last thing that I have for you is, do you have any interests outside of the field of orthopedics? We all love orthopedics. It's a great field, but do you have any interests outside of orthopedics? Um, I do. Um, and number one, uh, I have a one-year-old son, so he, my name Logan, um, so he keeps me quite busy uh, right now. Uh, Congratulations. Changed, thanks. Life's changed a lot since he came around, um, obviously for the better, uh, but I'm also a pretty big runner. Like I said, I run marathons. Um, I, I ran an Olympic trials in the marathon in 2020. Uh, oh, so wow. I've taken it pretty seriously uh, enough to say that I had definitely have other interests outside of orthopedics that keep me pretty busy too. Um, so that, that's definitely uh, been a passion of mine as well. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. I always find it interesting to, uh, you know, when we talk to guests and we find out the different things that they like to do and running, I think you may be the first runner uh, like the marathon runner that we've had on the show i had many interesting many guests but i think you're the first runner <laughs> well there are a lot of runner orthopedists but yeah my running I, now you know, consists of running stroller running for the most part but maybe i'll get back <laughs> into it one day <laughs> uh, that's awesome uh all right cool well let's go ahead and transition into the topic of the day 
we're going to talk about some knee OCD lesions. And uh, unfortunately, when I was reading up on this, a lot of the stuff that they were saying uh, kind of had to deal with a little adolescence, but we're going to try to focus a little bit more on adults. We can maybe just talk briefly about some of the adolescent things. But in your practice right now, how often are you seeing people with OCD lesions or can you kind of touch base on, on the incidents? So pediatric OCD lesions, which I know we'll touch upon today, um, not that frequently. Um, I have treated some in my practice, um, but it, not incredibly, you know, maybe five to 10%, if that. Yeah. Um, you know, so it's not a super common thing to see. And a lot of them, you know, as, as we'll get into, don't actually need surgery, uh, which is a great, a good thing for them. But uh, it's, it's not as common as you think. Uh, adult uh, OCD lesions, kind of go into the realm of treating, you know, isolated cartilage lesions and kind of keeping them in, in the same realm, an isolated cartilage lesion and an OCD lesion. Um, so that's definitely a more common thing that I would see. Um, a lot of those can be more post-traumatic, like you see in the setting of like an ACL tear, someone can have like a large lesion on the medial femoral condyle um, from trauma. Um, so some of those are, at least in, in my realm, treated in a similar fashion. Yeah. And, and so with with that, you know, with the etiology behind it, I know for adults, it's uh, mostly traumatic, kind of like you're saying, but for the, you know, the adolescents, it may deal with, you know, many other, <laughs> many other things like the vascular factors and, uh, you know, things with the epiphyses and things of that sort. Do you, do you, I, I know you don't necessarily take care of all of the, like the pediatric stuff, but do they, do, like, do you see those patients in your clinic? Like how often, if so, like, is there any anything, you know, any ideology or any reasons that you've seen that in, in the yeah, past? I mean, I would say like a lot of times when you see these in clinic, often it's incidental. Um, so you're like getting an x-ray and you get a notchio and you're like, oh, there's, you know, a big shadow there that could be an OCD lesion. Like a lot of people have, don't even know they have it. Um, additionally, um, it can be on the contralateral knee too. So a lot of times they're bilateral. Uh, so that kind of leads to maybe this being more of a genetic type, uh, especially in the juvenile associations, a genetic type factor. Right. And, and, and I think we're jumping the gun a little bit here. I, I didn't even think about it because sometimes we have medical students and, you know, interns that are listening to the podcast. What is, what does an OCD lesion stand for? I should have probably, <laughs> probably said that <laughs> yeah, a couple so, minutes yeah, ago. What does that, that stand for? So osteochondritis desiccans. So it, essentially just means there is a lesion of cartilage um, and that can include a little bit of the bone. So it's essentially at the location where the bone and the cartilage meet. Okay, perfect. And so when you have these patients, when they come to your clinic, you know, they, they come, they come in and you see them and you're looking at the sheet and you're going to go in and talk to them. What is that conversation like? Like, what are some of the important things that you definitely want to make sure that you ask or you figure out or, you know, when you're trying to get a history from these patients? So first off, um, obviously you start with how long they've had symptoms for. Um, a lot of these, especially in pediatric patients can be kind of vague symptoms for a long period of time, you know, over a period of a few months of describing some uh, knee pain uh, comes and goes. Sometimes you can have mechanical symptoms with un more unstable lesions um, of clicking or catching. Um, so, it's not necessarily going to be like a sentinel event of pain. It's something usually that's kind of gradually come on or off and on knee pain for quite some time that essentially will get worse as the lesion becomes more unstable um, sometimes. Um, so those are usually the main questions I ask. In adults, when you see them, you have to even see if they're symptomatic because sometimes you'll just see a cartilage lesion or um, see an old osteochondritis desiccans lesion on imaging. And if that, they may not even be symptomatic from it. So in those cases, you really don't need to do anything besides just watch it and see if they become symptomatic in the future. Oh, okay. So when they, when they, when they come, you know, when they see you in clinic, they're mostly just complaining of just some generalized knee pain, nothing, not like a specific. Yeah. I mean, they might have the tenderness part. to palpation or soreness. Let's say it's on the lateral femoral condyle versus medial femoral mm -hmm. condyle. You'll be able to, you know, pinpoint to where it is, but it's not often, you know, as, as specific as, you know, diagnosing a meniscus tear or something right. like that. And so when you're examining them, how, like, can you take us through your physical e examination? You know, say you have a brand new intern that, that came to spend the day with you and they're seeing you do a knee exam and they're seeing this, I don't know why it's for the first time, but say they're seeing an orthopedic knee exam. How are you taking them? Uh, like what, what kind of exam are you performing on these patients? 
Sure. So, I mean, first thing you want to do is see them walk, um, see if they have an antalgic gait, um, see if they're favoring one side versus the other. Um, and then you want to look at their alignment. So you look at their lower extremity alignment. You want to make sure that you can actually see both knees. So I put all my patients into shorts to be able to, to see their whole lower extremities. Um, you want to look at to see if they're uh, varus, which is kind of more bow-legged or right. uh, valgus, which is known as more knock kneed. Um, so you can, that can kind of play a role into how you will treat these both in pediatrics and adults. Um, and then, then I usually have the patient sit down. Um, I check how their patella tracks. Uh, so I have their knee go from the flexion to extension and you can see if their patella tracks laterally. Um, I'll place my hand onto the kneecap at this point too, to feel if there's any kind of crepitus or any kind of clicking underneath the kneecap area. Um, and then I usually have the patient lay down and then I'll take them full, through a full range of motion, see if they have pain at end, uh, end motion and extension or kind of mid range of motion pain, uh, obviously isolate which side the pain is coming from if possible. Um, you want to check then for tender to spell patients. So you're checking over your patellar facets, you're checking over your medial joint line, your lateral joint line, your patella uh, tendon, your quad tendon. So kind of palpate all throughout the knee. Um, particularly for these OCD lesions, you want to palpate like your medial femoral condyle. Uh, so just proximal to the joint line as well as your lateral femoral condyle. Um, and then, you know, there's uh, special tests that you'll have to take patients through. So you always want to check for le- knee stability of ligaments. Uh, so you'll, you, you test for your ACL with your Lachman exam, your anterior drawer. You can test for your PCL with your posterior drawer. And then you're always doing various valgus stress testing, which is, you know, kind of testing the side limit ligaments of the knee. Um, and kind of one other specific test you'll, I usually do is McMurray's test, um, which tests for a meniscus tear where you're putting the patient into flexion and essentially internally, externally, externally rotating the knee to try to elicit pain. Okay. Um, and then neurovascular, obviously. So that's kind of like my basic exam I do every day. Uh, I know you mentioned this Wilson's test here. Um, but that, you know, isn't a test that I would say most orthopedists perform. It, it's more of a, uh, academic, I guess, uh, type yeah. exam. Um, however, um, you know, I guess if you're really specifically have suspicion for an OCD lesion and you want to try it, you know, I don't think there's any harm in doing that. Yeah. This was the first time that I heard about it when I was reading up for this topic, I hadn't heard of the Wilson's test before. Which for those that are listening, so we we'll just give you, I guess, the academic exercise, <laughs> uh, and, and it's it's described as they have pain with uh, tibial internal rotation during extension, with relief with external rotation. Because I think, you know, the the thought process is that you may have some impingement of the tibial uh, spines on the condyles, and so just to recap everything you just said. Uh, when we're seeing these patients, you're taking a look at, you're having them walk in the office, you have them in shorts, you check their alignment of your knee, are they in fairs, are they in valgus, um, you check their range of motion, um, you check if they have any tenderness to palpation, especially if you're thinking about, uh, if you're thinking about OCD lesions, you want to try to palpate their condyles, just a little bit proximal to the joint line, as you were saying. You also want to do your ligamentous tests, your ACL test, PCL. You can do your test for your meniscus, uh, menisci, I guess is a, is a correct term as well, like your McMurray's. And then, you know, your, your other other special tests uh, for if you so elect to choose. But again, I haven't I haven't heard about anybody doing the Wilson's test. So. I don't know this, if they would ask an OIT question. I hope about not, that, but maybe. <laughs> I truly hope not, because again, this is the first yeah. time that I've heard about it. But so, do does everybody that comes in your clinic with knee pain get an X-ray? Like, what does your imaging work yes. look like? What are you doing? Yeah, everybody gets an X-ray generally before they see me, uh, unless they've already previously come in with imaging. Uh, and just like I said, a lot of that is you can find incidental things on the X-ray. Um, so, uh, yes, everybody will get an X-ray. And what x-rays are you getting? Are you just getting AP lateral? Are you getting like notch views or what are, what are you typically getting in your clinic? And then what are you looking for as well? Sure. So, uh, I mean, first off, we get weight-bearing x-rays. So the patients will be standing for these rather than supine. Um, we'll get an AP x-ray, a lateral x-ray, a notch view x-ray, uh, which is when the knee is more like in 20 to 30 degrees of flexion. Um, and that's a view that's pretty good actually for showing these OCD lesions. Uh, and then we always get like a sunrise or merchant view to show the patellofemoral joint. Um, so, I mean, really things you're looking for are any kind of, in general, you're looking for arthritis. So any kind of joint space narrowing, any bone spurs, obviously you're ruling out any kind of fracture. Um, 
And then uh, you want to look at like alignment uh, as well. Um, you can look to see how your patella is sitting. Um, and there's a number for patella alta um, or patella baja. Um, and then for these specifics for these osteochondritis desiccans lesions, you know, this is an example um, that you've included on an x-ray here. You can see on their uh, neofemoral condyle um, that there's kind of a shadow um, of a lesion, which in the other uh, more, I guess that's a flexion notch view, but it's just completely displaced uh, right. that lesion there. Um, so oftentimes you can see even on an x-ray, uh, the, if these are large enough, these osteochondritis desiccans lesions. So and besides location, um, is there, well, I guess not, not besides location, but what, when do you get an, like, so if you see this, like you see this view on the left where you just see that little shadow, are you getting an MRI or what is your advanced imaging like? Like, or are you doing it right away? Or are you giving it time? Well, let's say they're symptomatic. Are you getting an MRI then? Or when does, when does it more advanced imaging come into play? If you get advanced would, imaging in a pediatric patient, I would generally get an MRI. Um, okay. just because I wouldn't want to miss any kind of unstable lesion, um, or something that could be impending of becoming a loose body. Um, so especially, you know, if they're symptomatic, I'm getting MRI, if they're completely asymptomatic and it's an incidental finding, I generally will just watch it. Uh, and, and unless there's findings like on the x-ray that suggests it could be becoming an unstable lesion. Um, but if a patient is complaining of pain, I, I would get an, an MRI. So just to that's based on that point, what are some findings on x-ray that would, that would clue us into towards this is an unstable lesion? So, you know, first thing, like I said, I would look for size. Um, so right. it's a really big lesion. Then, you, you know, you want to be a little, you're a little bit more on guard and worried about that. Um, here you can actually see on, on these x-rays here. I mean, you yeah. can see that the, it's completely displaced there, but you can see on your, uh, on a, uh, on your AP there, there, that there's actually kind of like a ring of, um, you know, uh, darker um, imaging around the lesion. So that right. would be a suggestion that this could be more of an unstable lesion. Okay. And one other thing is, is when you're getting an MRI, what exactly are you looking for in the MRI? Yeah, so the MRI, you're looking to see, it, again, if the lesion stable versus unstable. So right. you want to look at the size of the lesion. Um, so that's number one, you want to look at the location of a lesion, but you know, it's on the medial femoral condyle, the lateral femoral condyle, you know, more of the trochlea, the patella, you want to see where this lesion is located. Um, and then to see if it, so if there's fluid that's tracking kind of underneath the cartilage bony surface here. So like, um, on your B, um, picture on the sagittal of the knee here, there's actually white fluid that's coming underneath this lesion. Um, so you can see that it's suggested that this lesion is a little more on the unstable side. Um, sometimes you can see more bony edema as well. So bony edema, you would see is more um, like white fluid in the bone. Um, that's suggestive of a more symptomatic or unstable lesion. Um, you also want to look at what the quality of the cartilage looks like, uh, where the lesion is. Sometimes there's going to be more damage to the cartilage um, on the surface of the lesion. Other times it actually looks pretty good. Um, and healthy. Uh, so that's another thing that you want to be assessing. Oh, okay. And, and so are there any, okay, so, you know, we went through the imaging, went through, you know, history of physical exams. Now, are there any classification systems that you typically use in practice or that, you know, use amongst other practitioners or most, or are most of them more like kind of for academic purposes? Yeah. I mean, I generally just classify based on how the um, lesion looks, you know, I'm not yeah. saying it's a go using a specific classification system to choose my surgical treatment or my management. Um, I just go by kind of the um, qual kind of the characteristics that I just described, whether or not the lesion, um, you know, has fluid tracking underneath it, whether it looks like it's starting to displace the quality of the cartilage, the size, the location. Um, those are kind of more important in, in the patient's symptoms as well in, in treating this, you know, so just going based on a classification system based on MRI, there's a lot more that goes into it uh, besides that. Okay. And, and, and when reading on this, uh, most of the, and I think I, I've even seen an OIT question on this is a more common location of these OCD lesions being at the lateral aspect of the medial femoral condyle. In practice, is that something that you've also seen as well, as far as where these uh, OCD lesions are? Yes. Um, I think it's, it's quoted to be like 70% are at this lateral aspect of the medial femoral condyle. 
And in a lot of the ones that are like incidentally found, I would say on x ray, that's generally where they end up being. Yeah. I wonder, but I, I wonder I will, why. the case that oh, yeah. I have at the end, if we get to it, is on the lateral fungal condo. So <laughs> it, it's not <laughs> the only that. place that it occurs. Oh, that's awesome. Um, so say, for example, because you mentioned a little bit earlier that we may have a patient that uh, that has this OCD legion that may be asymptomatic versus, you know, somebody that's symptomatic. How do these naturally progress if you just leave them on their own and you don't do anything, you know, if you don't do anything behind it? So it depends. Um, in pediatric OCDs, one thing that's important in kind of prognosis is if uh, they are skeletally immature still. So if their physes are open still, a lot of these can have the capability of healing. So there's a much better prognosis for skeletally immature patients. So um, that's one thing you can look into when you're thinking about prognosis. Um, but additionally, um, like a couple of the things that are mentioned here, um, if they're the lesions that are larger in size that have evidence on MRI of kind of fluid tracking underneath, um, more damage to the cartilage on the overlying uh, area, um, I think usually they say patellar lesions as well as lateral femoral condyle lesions generally don't do as well as the media femoral condyle lesions. Um, so those are kind of things we can predict outcome for. Okay. So, you know, we've seen these patients uh, in the clinic, we've gotten x-rays, we've diagnosed them with an OCD lesion of the medial femoral condyle. Can you take us through your algorithm as far as treating these and, you know, how do we manage like which ones we're going to treat when they have symptoms and, and what is your treatment algorithm? So depending on symptoms, um, obviously if it's symptomatic, um, but a non-displaced lesion that's stable, uh, if the patient's, you know, skeletally immature or, um, the lesion itself looks pretty stable. Um, I'll try obviously a trial of non-operative treatment. Um, I okay. think it's pretty much, it's quoted that like 60% of these can get better with non-operative treatment. Um, so that usually is obviously activity modification, meaning if they're playing sports, they've got to rest from sports uh, for uh, probably up to a few months. Um, sometimes they'll protect, protect their weight bearing uh, for a period of like four to six weeks uh, on crutches um, to be able to really give us a better chance to heal and quiet down the symptoms. Um, plus or minus putting them in a, a brace. Um, I might lock them up in a brace, just an extension while ambulating for a few weeks, uh, again, uh, just to give us the best chance to heal. Um, but I'll get patients always into early physical therapy, continuing to work on quad strength, range of motion, um, with the anticipation of, you know, probably spending at least three months to see if this is going to heal non-operatively. Okay. So say, you know, say you, you do the whole nine yards, you know, you give them their medications, you have them, you know, in crutches, you have them in physical therapy and they come back and they're saying, you know, doc, it got a little bit better, but my knee is still bothering me. You know, I'm still having um, some, some swelling every now and then what is your treatment algorithm then? And then also one more question is, does this algorithm change at all? If it is a high level athlete, like if you're taking care of, uh, you know, I don't know, football running back or volleyball player, or, you know, like if it's a high level athlete, does your algorithm change at all? Probably in a young patient. No. Um, okay. I would still treat them pretty similarly. Um, it, maybe I'd be a little bit honestly more cautious and uh, just making sure that they're really fully ready and fully healed before they went back. Um, I would probably get a new MRI. Um, prior to question. any kind of return to sport, just to assess that it really does look uh, healed or at least, um, you know, stable still, um, especially if they're asymptomatic at that point. Um, so I would just be probably be a little bit more um, assured that they're ready to go back and be happy to get more imaging. Um, because these are pretty big surgeries, uh, for the right. most part, especially in the unstable lesions. So if these patients have a capacity to heal on their own, you know, that's really the best way uh, forward for them. Okay. So say, you know, again, we tried not op didn't work. Can you take us through your, or, or what, what patients are you going to operate on? You know, we had that one scenario where it was a stable lesion. We tried not op and it's not working. Uh, so what, you know, in your experience, what patients do you, is surgical indicate is surgical management indicated on? And then what is like your algorithm for, for treating these? So for a stable lesion that fails non-operative treatment, um, if we first talk like pediatric patients, uh, for those stable lesions, there's a couple of things you can do. Um, you can do um, 
essentially like retrograde um, drilling with a K-wire, essentially, which you do under fluoroscopy, essentially taking K-wire through uh, the femoral condyle up into the um, subchondral surface just through the bone. So you don't actually violate the cartilage. Um, that's an option. And essentially, that's used to kind of just simulate healing uh, into that subchondral bony area underneath the osteochondroid dysplasticans lesion. Um, you can also do transarticular drilling, um, which is a little bit easier technique. Essentially, you could even do it arthroscopy, arthroscopically, essentially visualize the lesion um, and take a K wire and make a, a number of holes directly through the cartilage. Up Obviously, there's a downside that you're drilling through the cartilage and making some damage there. It's a much, it's technically, you know, I would say easier to do unless you do a, a lot um, of um, the, you know, more retrograde drilling. Um, the, the one thing I will note about that is sometimes it is a little bit hard to tell in these lesions that have like, you know, pristine looking articular cartilage over the area. You really have to like probe it and see if the uh, cartilage feels very soft in that area. Um, it's, it's not like as obvious as, as you would think. Um, especially as obvious as the pictures. Yeah, yeah, exactly. (laughs) Right. Um, some, you know, in an adult, if you have, um, you know, a stable lesion, you're not going to be treating it that same way because adults just don't have the same capacity to heal. So you're not really doing any kind of drilling, you know, that would be kind of called microfracture in an adult, essentially, like where you remove the cartilage and you can poke holes into the bone to see if it helps, uh, and regrow, you know, fiber cartilage in that case. And we know that, um, microfracture really isn't a very durable procedure and doesn't work very well, especially in bigger lesions. Um, so in kind of adult, um, you know, cartilage lesions or even, you know, osteochondritis desiccans lesions, you're either doing, you know, a debridement for the, the most, you know, minimally invasive type thing, or you could do some kind of cartilage restoration procedure, um, including osteochondral allograft, autograft, or, um, or I would say that you could talk about Macy, um, yeah. as well. Uh, for ACI. However, if there is like a lot of bony involvement underneath an irregular bone, uh, you, you generally um, would want to sway towards doing the bone with cartilage replacement or the osteochondral allograft or autograft. Okay, so a question I have is at what point do you say that, you know, we're not, we're going to, we're going to do an autograph, like an osteochondral autograph versus, you Allograft. know, Allograft versus like, you know, um, versus trying to fix it with, for example, a screw fixation with like a headless compression screw or something. Yeah. So adults, you're not really fixing things. Okay. Um, if it completely displaces an adult, just because it's not going to heal very well. Pediatrics in big, you know, acute, if a, a, a unstable lesion that completely displaces, you can try to fix that. Um, just because like I said, it peds just has better capacity to heal if you get to it in a quick period of time. Okay. Um, and if there's a little bit of bone underneath it too, um, you can definitely try to fix that. If it ends up being like, you know, a very thin sliver of bone, that's a little bit less likely uh, to be able to heal. Okay. Um, but Ramon, what was your question again? The osteochondral allograft versus yeah. autograft? Correct. Yeah. yeah. So, autograph. Yeah. And that depends a lot on size. Um, so you can do autograft really with a very small lesion. Um, you know, I would only do it probably if you were going to use one or two plugs and they're usually, you know, 10 millimeters, you know, pretty small plugs for that. I usually use allograft for most things because I find most of these lesions that you're going to be treating surgically end up being big enough for an osteochondral allograft anyway. Um, and, you know, obviously with osteochondral autograft, you end up having to take from another portion of the knee too. Um, so my preference is to use the allograft unless it was a very small lesion. And can you, can you describe, we, we briefly mentioned a little bit earlier, but you know, we're talking now we're really talking about adults with these full thickness defects. Can you talk about the difference between like AC versus like Macy mosaic plasty? You, you briefly mentioned, um, uh, micro a little bit earlier as well, where you, where you, you know, poke holes and you want fiber cartilage that type one cartilage to, uh, hopefully, you know, grow and heal that, that lesion. But can you talk about the difference between like AC and Macy and, uh, I guess, yeah, basically those two things. And also I'll ask you about de novo uh, a little afterwards. Yeah. So yeah, there's obviously a number of different um, cartilage restoration type procedures on the market. When you kind of go through the um, pyramid of treating cartilage uh, procedures, uh, like the least invasive, I usually start from the least invasive, kind of go up to the most invasive in my algorithm. And like the least invasive you're doing, that surgical is just a chondroplasty. So going in, debriding the lesion and getting out. 
Um, and then you, the kind of the next one I, I usually go to, which I don't generally do, um, is, um, microfracture, which is, you know, just poking holes in the bone for fiber cartilage for smaller lesions. But like I said, we don't generally do that as much anymore, just because we know it doesn't work, um, for a long period of time. Um, then, you know, we get to the bigger lesions, um, and then you can have your options of doing, um, osteochondral allograft, autograft, Macy, um, in de novo type, um, you know, cartilage procedures. Um, de novo is something that's essentially juvenile articular cartilage that's been chopped up into like a bunch of little tiny pieces and you essentially clear off the cartilage lesion and then put the tiny pieces of cartilage in there and, um, uh, glue them down, uh, essentially. Um, I really only use that, uh, for cartilage lesions of the patella. So mm, if I was okay. doing like, um, a, um, MPFL reconstruction and the patient ended up having some kind of cartilage lesion. Sometimes I would use de novo uh, to treat that. Um, it's not necessarily, I don't even think it's like approved. Um, yeah, I think it's, it's approved not paid for, the for but I'm not sure. yeah, it's not approved for like in, by insurance companies. You don't even like get reimbursed for it. Um, so, uh, you know, I haven't used it that much in practice. I did a lot more during fellowship. Um, but yeah, that would be the indication that I would use essentially de novo for, um, you know, Macy, um, uh, the matrix induced autologous chondrocyte implantation is a two stage procedure. So um, you have to actually go in and scope the knee and then you actually take a biopsy of cartilage, usually from the notch, and then it actually gets sent to a lab and essentially you grow like a collagen matrix of cartilage, um, like a patch that you can go in in a second stage and put that back in. Um, that um, I generally would only, I usually use that for lesions that don't have any kind of bony involvement. Um, so it's like a pure cartilage shear injury. Okay. I would, my preference would be to use the Macy procedure. Um, and then lastly, uh, you know, the, at the top of my realm is the osteochondral allograft, um, autograft. Um, and like I said, it depends kind of on the size of the lesion. This is where you're taking a piece of bone. Uh, as well with cartilage in it. So if a patient has you know, irritation in the bone underneath the cartilage, um, you've got to treat the bone too. Um, so that's why I, I would use that at the end. And, you know, it's also probably the most invasive procedure, you know, you're reaming into their cartilage and, and bone and taking out, uh, you know, a big plug and putting um, an allograft in there. So like a worst case scenario, if someone fails a Macy, you can always go back and do an osteochondral allograft later. Once you fail an osteochondral allograft, you're getting to be more limited options, looking more towards, you know, arthroplasty type options. And one last thing before you, you know, go to your case, do you, or how often are you, are you seeing these? And then you're also seeing like patients that have a deformity and you're doing like an osteotomy or something of that sort. Yeah. That's a great question. I was going to bring that up before we moved on to, because always in your workup of these, you really should be looking at alignment. Um, because you never want to do, uh, you know, an osteochondral allograft, uh, you know, a big graft to somebody's medial femoral condyle when they're in a significant amount of varus. Um, so that is always something in your workup that you should get like long leg, lower length, um, or long leg, um, lower extremity films to be able to measure mechanical access. Um, so I, you know, I'm not doing it all that often, but it's indicated, um, you know, you can do a, a distal femoral osteotomy for your, uh, valgus knees. Um, and for essentially for like, if you're offloading the lateral femoral condyle, or you can do your high tibial osteotomy for your varus knees, uh, to offload the medial femoral condyle. Awesome. Well, I, I think we covered a, a good amount, you know, on these, on these OCD lesions, we talked about, um, kind of how they present, um, history, physical exam findings, what they look like on x-rays, MRIs, and went through a good amount of the kind of treatment algorithm. Anything else that you want the people to know about before we kind of go to your, your case uh, that you have for us? You know, the only, the only other thing I didn't really talk about um, was for some of these unstable lesions in like pediatric patients. Uh, we talked a little bit about uh, like fixing them, but sometimes you have like uh, the unstable lesion that is not necessarily displaced yet. And what you want to do for those is actually displace the lesion, meaning like, you know, try to trap door it and open it, clean off the undersurface uh, of the bone there, and then try to fix that back down. Um, so, you know, and you can fix it with like a, a screw or something like that. Um, but that was uh, not something I talked about earlier, but that is one other method of fixation that should be brought up. 
Okay. Awesome. Yeah, I think that's great. And I think that's a great overview. And we did a great overview of the cartilage lesions, not cartilage lesions, but the cartilage restoration uh, treatment uh, options. So for those that are that are listening and studying boards and are having an, a hard time understanding what that is, just go back and listen to those previous two to three minutes. And uh, Dr. Bishop did a great job going over that. Now, uh, what we can do, Dr. Bishop, I know you, you've been so nice to uh, have a case for us. For those that are listening to this, you can go and check out the YouTube channel if you actually want to see the images and the things that we're talking about. We'll try to describe it the best way we can over an audio podcast. Um, but if you want to check out and actually see some of the things we're looking at, go and check out the Nail It Ortho YouTube channel. Um, but Dr. Bishop, can you kind of walk us through this? Uh, can you kind of walk us through this OCD lesion case? Sure. So this was a 15 year old um, basketball player that I saw. Um, that came to me, it was actually a week after his uh, sentinel injury, I would say, where he was playing basketball. He was doing like, you know, slides or something during warm up, And he like felt a, you know, kind of like pop or click in the knee um, and basically lost his ability to fully extend the knee. So he lost about his last 15 to 20 degrees of terminal extension. Um, he came in on crutches, it'd been like a week. Um, before he saw anyone, um, he did note that he had about six months of kind of like vague knee pain that he kind of just brushed off because it never really bothered him all that much. Um, and uh, so these were his x-rays that he came in with. Um, so like I said, we got standing, um, you know, weight bearing x-rays. Um, we have our AP, our lateral, our uh, notch view, as well as our sunrise view. Um, and you know, the most important thing that I noticed on these was that kind of shadow that you can see on the lateral femoral condyle that Wendell's pointing out with his arrow, um, signifying that, uh, yeah, maybe there's something going on, um, possibly some kind of osteochondritis desiccans lesion. Yeah. 15 years old, acute event, and you can definitely see it, um, you know, right, right, right here for those that are, that are watching. And so this is his pre-op MRI. It looks like you know, go ahead and click play. So here's his medial femoral condyle, uh, medial tibial plateau looks okay. His PCL, his ACL looks okay. Oh. And then you start to see his lateral femoral condyle. Oh, every time. Essentially looks like there's a large shark bite taken out of it. Um, but you can also see in the front of the knee in the notch, there is, you can actually see the huge displaced piece. Um, oh, if yeah. you take your arrow and see it, of the osteochondral lesion. So it's literally just sitting in the front of the knee in yeah, the notch right there. there. And, you know, you can see the huge missing piece of cartilage from the weight bearing portion of his uh, lateral femoral condyle. So this was about a three by two centimeter lesion. Uh, so this was a really big displaced lesion that was, uh, you know, fully displaced, unstable lesion. Wow. So I assume we, we took him to, <laughs> to surgery. Yeah. Right? So my plan, obviously, at this point, it had been probably like uh, two weeks, you know, by the time we got the MRI and uh, we're going in for treatment. So it was a big piece. So, you know, being that he was still, his spices were somewhat open still and they were getting close to closing, but uh, he still did have a little bit of growth left. Um, my plan was to go in and scope the knee. Um, you know, my worst case scenario was going to be to take the piece out and then go back later and do an osteochondral allograft. Um, but okay. given that he was so young and this was a relatively acute injury, you know, my goal was to go in and try to fix, uh, the lesion. Um, so here's the, uh, arthroscopic pictures, um, the pictures at the top you can actually, I think the lesions off to the right. Um, you can see part of it and, um, you can, so, yeah, you can actually see where the cartilage is missing. I thought I had a picture yeah. of the actual piece floating around. Maybe that's it in the front there. It's a little bit hard to tell. Yeah. Um, but the picture, the pictures at the bottom is actually after I opened. So I, I took pictures there and you can just see how large, um, this lesion is, um, with the cartilage surrounding it in the white. And then obviously you can see the underlying bone. Um, so, you know, what I did at this point, I did a, a medial arthrotomy to the knee, um, you know, retracted the patella over, uh, exposed our lateral femoral condyle. Um, and, uh, the first thing I wanted to do was obviously save that, find that piece, Yep. Um, and make sure it was well protected on the back table. Um, you can take, and then I use the curette to kind of clean up all the um, undersurface there, um, get any fibrous tissue away. You can use a K wire to also kind of stimulate um, some bleeding and, and draw some holes in that uh, area as well. Okay. Um, and then, you know, if you go to the next slide, I think we have final. So then, oh, yeah. so I use some K wires to actually take the piece and then hold it in place. 
um, and actually keyed in relatively well, um, which was, ha was, you know, good. Uh, I was somewhat concerned about that. Um, and then my options were at this point, how do I fix this thing? So yep. do I use, uh, you know, metal screws, really headless compression metal screws, um, or do I use some kind of bio um, absorbable screw? Um, so I ended up using a bunch. I think I used like seven um, bio, headless bioabsorbable screws um, just for the fact that I didn't want to have to go back and take out the metal screws. Because we generally recommend, you know, after three months, you remove those metal screws just so they don't end up, you know, damaging the cartilage or things like that later. Right. Um, so, you know, the downsides of these bioabsorbable screws is, you know, sometimes you don't get, they can break when you put them in. Um, and you also sometimes don't just don't get great, you know, bite um, and reduction. But this guy had really good bone and, you know, there was a good amount of bone underneath the piece. Um, so I actually like felt I was getting good bites with each one and a good reduction. Um, so I ended up um, sticking with using his um, bioabsorbable screws. So I didn't end up having to go back in a secondary procedure uh, to take them out. Um, so this was in the final fixation and you can kind of see uh, it keyed in pretty nicely. Yeah, I mean that's a pretty that's a huge piece. Was it sitting up on, under the um, right underneath the patella when you open it up? Yeah, it was kind of like in his infrapatellar pat, fat pad, sitting right in the front in the notch. Wow, yeah, yeah. that that sucks. Huge piece. Yeah, is a, I'm, I'm hoping this kid gets back to playing basketball at some point. Um, mm. But you know, he was according to his dad going to be a, a D1 player. So we'll see <laughs> as most, as most kids are going to be. At this of course stage, but, they, they all are. Yeah. Oh, and then you can really see here on the, the, these uh, coronals, how, how big that a defect is. Yeah. And then oh, there's okay. the piece. If you go all the way to the front, you can see the piece just sitting there too. Um, it's coming right there. So oh, yeah. look at that. Yeah. So so, then um, so is... anyway, I just saw this guy like last week um, okay. and I got her six, six months. So for these people post-op initially, if they're non weight bearing for about six or six weeks um, or, uh, you know, maybe allowing for toe touch weight bearing and a brace locked in extension. Um, sometimes you can give them a CPM machine, which is a continuous passive motion machine essentially to, you know, um, allow for a kind of um, early motion as well as kind of lubricate the cartilage to help um, some healing. Um, and then at six weeks, you usually unlock the brace, let them start walking a little bit, um, and really start working on full range of motion and then strengthenings doesn't really start until a little bit later on return to sport for these patients is often eight to 12 months after. Um, so I generally get a new MRI at six months. Okay. Um, it's a little bit hard to tell what's going on in this guy's MRI just because there's a lot of artifacts from the screws, but yep. I would say, I mean, the lesions and the pieces intact still. Um, in the posterior aspect, uh, there's still a little bit of fluid that's, you know, underlying the back portion of the graft. So I'm hoping that, you know, continues to heal, um, with time, um, cause it's only been six months and you really can see healing up to kind of like a year after this. Um, so, uh, you know, at this point we're still kind of holding on back from going into sports and we'll repeat that MRI again in a year. Um, but he's clinically doing well. He has no pain. He has oh, no awesome. mechanical symptoms. Um, you know, he's still kind of just getting into the phases of strengthening. Um, but this was a little bit of a hail Mary. I hope this heals. So, um, he's doing okay so far. <laughs> well, that's, that's what matters. I, I, I mean, I think that was a, a great case there in here. Let's look at these coronals too. You could definitely see it on the, on those sagittals. Oh yeah. Yeah. Look, you can see that pretty well there. Yeah. I mean, it doesn't look that pretty, but I mean, it's, it seems to be doing the job at this point. So yeah, we'll see, I mean we'll see if he, uh, how he does with return to sport and things like that. Yeah. At least the articular surface uh, looks pretty good as well. You know, I don't see any yeah, big step offs or anything. I think so too. So. Well, that's awesome. Well, well, Dr. Bishop, we, uh, I appreciate you a lot for coming on the podcast and taking time out of your day to talk to us a little bit about, you know, these OCD lesions of the knee and providing case, good case too, by the way, very interesting. Um, really thank you again so much for coming on the podcast. Uh, any last words that you want the listeners to know about, you know, OCD lesions of the knee? I know I asked this a little bit earlier, but anything else that you could think of before you yeah, wrap I up mean, here? In all honesty, I think, I think you covered it. Um, I, I, obviously I would always say treat the patient, not necessarily the MRI is probably the advice that we give when treating cartilage lesions. Yeah, totally agree. 
Uh, Dr. Bishop, I appreciate it. You again so much for coming on the podcast. Uh, thanks so much for those that are listening. I hope you all really enjoyed this episode as much as I did. And I hope you go and leave us a review and let us know how much you enjoyed it. And uh, we will see you all again next week. And again, thank you so much, Dr. Bishop.